some hype for Shentok with Magic Knight Ray Earth. Any percent, no Palizu skip. I'm just going to restart the console. All right, uh, Magic Knight Ray Earth for the sake of Saturn. Uh, just to start in a second. Uh, want me to uh, want me to count down? All righty. Uh, so I'm just uh, let's see. Three, two, and one. Let's go. All right. So I'm Shentok. This is Karaoke, and this is the RPG chick. And Magic Knight Rareth on the Sega Saturn. It's uh, we're going to start out with a real quick out of bounds skip, and then we'll just talk about the story. Uh, this is basically the skip: uh, have an NPC push us out of bounds and allow us to skip about 35 minutes of cutscenes. It's pretty fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but the downside is it skips like everything that uh, talks about the story. There we go. Nice. Uh, so we need to adjust some settings because we want fast message speed, and then change controls. And then just going to go hold up right, right here as we go off the screen. And for whatever reason, there's a damage tile that is there. Normally, we can only play as Hikaru, the red-haired girl. But uh, for whatever reason, it's still set up that it'll swap characters when each one uh, runs out of health. And when you die in this area, the game doesn't know what to do with you. So it sends us straight to the first village of the game, skipping everything at the start. And if you want to get us caught up on the story, that'd be great, because I'm just going to be talking to some NPCs. Um, I guess I'll start. So uh, what ends up happening is uh, Hikaru runs into uh, Fu and Umi, who are the other two characters here in uh, Tokyo Tower. And uh, all of a sudden, this magical princess appears out of nowhere and warps them to this world of Sephiro. Um, they find themselves kind of uh, at odds with a monster, and they are saved by a powerful magician named Clef. Uh, and Clef kind of tells them, like, oh, hey, you've been brought here to become magic knights and save Sephiro. Um, and in order to save Sephiro, you're going to have to essentially learn some magic, you're going to have to get weapons, um, and you're going to have to get stronger, obviously. So, um, Clef sends these three girls uh, off on their mission to the Silent Forest to get their weapons. Um, unfortunately, Clef does get attacked by one of the main villains, which is, which, uh, her name is Alcione. We don't see her too much in this run, but, uh, we will run into her at some point. And, uh, and then he is turned to stone by a priest named Sagato. And then they run into the Silent Forest as all of that is happening. And uh, Carrie, you want to tell us what happens in the Silent Forest? Sure thing. So in the Silent Forest, they run into a swordsman named Ferio, who helps them defeat a monster and find their way through the forest. And at the end of the forest, Alcione attacks them again. Uh, they learn uh, some of their magic then, and also find the two-dimensional spring of Eterna that they have to jump into from the top um, of a cliff. And within there, they face their um, sort of their greatest fears, so they have to fight something dear to them. Hikaru fights her dog, uh, Flash, or Hikari. Fu fights herself, and Umi fights her parents. And after that, they gain the uh, mystical material known as a Scudo to bring back to Precia, who creates their weapons for them. And that's where we pick up after they arrive at this village here. Yeah, and in this village, they're being plagued by monsters uh, that are attacking the village. Uh, they, Lucino, this wizard that's stopping us, put up a barrier to try and uh, keep the monsters out, but the barrier is weakening. And so the village elder asked us to help since we've been outed as the Magic Knights, and he's, you know, protecting his ego and trying to stop us from doing everything we can to help. Yeah, the, uh, the Silent Forest kind of serves as a, as a tutorial for movement, for jumping and, and uh, basic attacks, um, whereas this dungeon kind of introduces some of the more puzzle-like elements, and you can see where uh, Shantak was just moving the block before, um, and then things here as well, and uh, anything, some of them are magic-related as well, and you can only solve some of the puzzles, puzzles with magic. Yep. And uh, one thing you'll notice is you'll see me jumping into every transition screen. Uh, normally when you go in transition screen, you lose any momentum you get towards building up running speed. But if you jump into it, you get to keep uh, your, running, your running speed and any momentum you're working towards it. Oops. So I try to keep that as much as I can since uh, running is way faster. And there's, uh, for the longest time in the run, there's no way to just run on command. Oops. There we go. Oops. 
sometimes I was trying to weave through those uh, monsters there, but sometimes it's going to be a little tricky. And then this dungeon is really basic. It's just pushing blocks and opening doors for the first uh, or for this dungeon. Yeah, uh, in this game, unlike uh, in some other RPGs, you don't actually gain any experience from fighting monsters. You can get um, maybe some HP recovery, some yeah. MP recovery, um, but the uh, extra uh, hit points and magic points are gained from collecting various uh, items throughout the game. And also for defeating bosses, each character uh, has like a, a predetermined level up. We actually skipped one of them by skipping the intro of the game. So uh, normally we'd have a charged attack, uh, which is actually quite helpful at this stage of the game and not really in the rest of the game. But because we skipped that, we just have a basic attack that can't really do a whole lot. And see here, this is like a healing fountain, but Lucino is doing everything he can just to prevent us from succeeding. So we drink the entire fountain dry. It just bounces off. So that, that little red heart on the bottom uh, left corner there was uh, one of the HP up items, and the uh, MP up item is uh, essentially like a blue tier. And then here we get a mirror. Uh, we learn new spells through these mirrors. Uh, that is Clef. He's, he's turned to stone right now, but somehow we can still communicate with us. Magic. Magic, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's in the title. <laughs> And so if you saw that little thing teleport in, uh, basically the monster just teleports around and shoots projectile, but if you leave the screen before they teleport away, they just despawn, and it's pretty handy. So each of the characters has their own strengths. Uh, Fu, the blonde, is our, healer, is our main healer. She does have a damage attack, but it's quite weak. But it's used to get him out of the way. <laughs> and then he... Uh, Hikaru it mainly focuses on fire magic, and she's about the same strength as Umi in terms of magic damage. But we don't use her beyond until or we use her until we get uh, Umi's level two magic, which is, does the same damage as Hikaru's, but is uh, shorter cast time and less lag frames. So now we're gonna get into the first boss of the game. So it's like a giant cra crab spider. I think its like name is uh, Arachnadia. I think that's what. Uh, Ascot calls it. Yeah, Ascot being another one of the evil people. He was standing outside of the cave when we walked in, and this is one of his pets. Yeah, Ascot has a, a, a lot, a lot of um, monster pets, and if you've ever seen the anime, there's even more, I think, than we encounter in the game. So here, um, if you notice him, Fentok is switching to Hikaru, but then switching back to Umi. And if you notice, Umi's MP bar is actually uh, down to one and her uh, water dragon attack takes two MP to use. So you're wondering, how is that possible that he's still using it? Um, this is called the magic glitch. What he is doing is switching characters and at the same time, on the same frame, also hitting the magic button. And that allows you to sort of use another character's MP to cast um, a magic spell when you don't have enough without actually using any MP. And that is the fastest way and that is how we are going to be taking down all the bosses in the game. It's especially helpful early on here when we don't have any charged weapons whatsoever. Yeah, this boss fight is really difficult when you don't have uh, your basic charged weapon. Like, you just don't, you do like one point of damage and it takes a very long time, like probably like upwards of like 10 minutes even. It's pretty crazy. But that fight went really well. Sometimes he can really bounce around the screen a lot. And there he's pretty cooperative. And you'll basically see all the bosses in the game just go down in a similar fashion. It really just removes a lot of luck in the run, which is really nice. And so now uh, we defeated the monster. We gave Lucino the credit just because we're nice and I guess it grows our hearts and makes us stronger because of our Scudo weapons. And uh, Hikaru got a level up here, so it makes her now our strongest member of the party. Now if you're playing casually, Umi becomes your strongest uh, I think she's about the same as Hikaru early on, but after a couple levels ups, or level ups, she becomes insanely strong with her charged attack. It has a, a very long reach, and it does a lot of damage. But for the early part of the, until a couple dungeons later, we're going to mainly use Hikaru for our, our source of damage since she gets a level two magic really early. Yeah, and that little boy that uh, flashed in and flashed out was Ascot. Yeah. He's a good kid, just hanging out with a bad crowd. <laughs> 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 so 
so now we're going to Taflon where they're being plagued by whirlpools and they're, they're a fishing village and with the whirlpools going on, they can't do any fishing, so their livelihood's being threatened. It's basically with Emerald gone, the whole country of Sephiroth has gone into chaos. Yeah, so uh, Princess Emerald essentially is, is the, the pillar for Sephiro and she's supposed to spend all of her time uh, praying for um, all the good things to happen in this, uh, in this world. And with her captured, she basically can't do any of that, and the world starts to fall apart, which is one of the reasons that the Magic Knights are here to save things. Mm -hmm. So we want to get across, but we don't know how to swim, so we're in this town looking for someone. We talked to that fellow in the, r in the building on the right side of town who talks about a man named Caltus who used to live here, and he was a really good sw a swimmer. And now we talked to this girl named Sarah, uh, and... She used to be friends with Caltus, but she lost her last pet uh, who drowned at sea, and Caltus uh, was pretty upset that he couldn't save her pet. But now Sarah has a, has a nice little new little old drag pink dragon pet. But now we're going to back to Polyzoo Village to find uh, Caltus, who has exiled himself uh, because he was just uh, inconsolable with l making her unhappy. Yeah, throughout the course of this game, uh, there's a couple of essentially uh, special skills that you can pick up. And uh, Caltus here is going to teach us the first of those. Yep. And we're just going to learn how to swim like beavers. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get to hear some of the wonderful voice acting that has been uh, mostly skipped so far. Uh, if you noticed when Shentok was doing the attacks in the boss battle, the... Voice clips were in Japanese, and uh, the translator, this was translated by Working Designs, uh, they left the uh, voice clips for battle in Japanese, but everything else is going to be in English. Um, the Japanese version of the game has a lot more voice acting overall in terms of the cutscenes and just normal text that's being spoken. The English version cut a lot of that out. There is a uh, secret thing you can buy that has a lot of uh, voice acted things in it so far, but... Um, yeah, we're going to hear a little bit of the actual voice acting coming up in the next uh, cutscene here. And voice acting, voice acted text can't be skipped, so you have to sit through and listen to it. And that is why the Japanese version is slower than the English version for the speedrun. Because mm -hmm. about like 98% of the te uh, text is voice acted in Japanese, where as they decided not to vi voice act most of it in the U.S. release. Yeah, basically any one of those NPCs that you see has their own kind of portrait um, has voice acting in the Japanese version. Yeah. Also, the uh, animated cutscenes are not skippable in the Japanese version either. Yeah, it makes it about mm, like an hour longer run. Yeah, there are a fair amount of cutscenes uh, in this game. Mm -hmm. But luckily we can skip them all here. So now we're going to be tossed in the water. <laughs> and that's like the best way to teach anyone how to swim, apparently. I mean, hey. <laughs> <laughs> And we learn the Roaring Rapid Wave Dash. <laughs> and so two of the girls, they get it right away, but Fu, she, she needs a little help. So we just give her a nice little light preserver to help her swim. Clef. And Precious. Mysterious Cephro Lecture number, number two. two. Now you may wonder why there's a number two. There was a number one that teaches you how to save in the game, but we skipped that in the, the chunk, the large chunk of the game we skipped at the beginning. The girls have learned how to swim like beavers. Now they can journey to the ice cave on the island to the north. By pressing the attack button while in the water, the girls swim forward. It's that easy. Okay, that's it for now. We hope you're enjoying the game. See you later, kids. And the fourth wall has been shattered. <laughs> <laughs> so swimming in this game is basically just mashing the attack button. Luckily, you don't have to mash too fast. Uh, you just like uh, just a slow mash, and you'll be able to go at maximum speed. So now we're finally able to swim, so we can s navigate the whirlpools. Now, normally, what they do expect you to do is go all the way around this map to reach our destination. But we all we have to do is just hold up uh, for a couple of whirlpools, and it'll just drag us right where we need to go. And then we just hold up right here. And then up again, and it'll just let us squeeze right through instead of having to take the maze all the way around to get here. And now we get the obligatory ice dungeon.
Yeah, so this dungeon is going to add a slightly new mechanic to some of the block puzzles because, well, ice physics. Mm -hmm. Luckily, the ice physics don't affect your movement. Uh, don't, you do have kind of, like, your movement's pretty tight, except when you're running, then it gets uh, quite slippery. But it's pretty easy to adapt to. So we get to melt some ice blocks with fire. Uh, for the most part, the element of your attack doesn't really matter. There's just two bosses where it matters. Or actually, no, only one Only one boss where it technically matters and another one where it doesn't exactly matter, but they take less damage from uh, certain magic attacks. So, yeah, just like uh, the ice blocks, they just keep moving until they hit something. Uh, these puzzles are really straightforward and basic. Uh, I don't think they put a lot of effort into that. I think they went, went more in the dungeon design. Oh, he's chasing me down. Sometimes those... Um, Ogres or Cyclopses, whatever they are, they, they just run across the map and chase you down until they hit you. And they do three points of damage. And we, oh, whoops. We do not want Hikaru to die because we need her here. So now we learn Hikaru's uh, second spell, which is called Flaming Shock. It's a, an AoE attack. It does significant chunk of damage. But for as far as puzzle solving, we only need it once. But it'll be used for the next boss fight as well, since it'll be our most potent uh, source of damage. And there we go. And those little gnat things, they just annoy you. They don't actually do any damage. It's really strange. So we're just going to, since uh, Hikaru doesn't have any mana, we're just going to do a magic glitch here and take that down. And so now for the remainder of the dungeon, we're going to play as Fu. Uh, there's a, a switch we have to hit with an arrow, and then uh, there's a room we have to clear of enemies to proceed, and she's uh, re ready to go for all that. I think we could probably throw it over for a couple donations right now. Yeah. Wonderful, because we have a plenty that came in. We have a $250 donation from Nori, who says, Had to show my love and support for my boy Shentak in his run of MKR. In this land that is far, Lafargo away, there is evil brewing, but fairy or not. Our heroines, Umi, Hikaru, and of course, my waifu, will save the day. <laughs> they would never find themselves in over the heads and will cleft that evil in half. Run faster than the girls swimming like beavers, Shentak, the neighborhood and the sushi bar are behind you. And remember, boom! <laughs> Thank you so much, Nori. <laughs> We also have a $10 donation from Navira. Love Magic Knight Rayarth, smiley face. And a $10 donation from Sirenari. I love Magic Knight Rayearth. Good luck on the run, Shentak. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so now we're at the end of the dungeon where we find one of the first uh, ancient machines that uh, we were tasked with finding. Uh, Saris, I believe the name is? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, which is Umi's machine. And when we first see it, when we first see each machine, they appear as a as a mythical beast, and they eventually turn into a Gundam type robot. But more importantly, we also get to see our best friend Makona for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> ba -ba. Ba -ba. <laughs> so now that the ancient machine is awakening, the this ice cave is falling apart. And here we're finally introduced to Ascot. And then Sarah's poor little pet Jiminy is being transformed into a giant beast. Complete with fireworks. Oh yeah. And you get to see the beautiful of uh, mid-90s CG. <laughs> Uh, poor little Sarah lost her house, and now she's losing her new pet. Yeah. Yeah, so there, there are um, parts of this game that kind of deviate from the anime and parts that are very similar. This is somewhat similar. Uh, except that Sarah's usually, uh, in the anime, uh, holds Umi back uh, while Hikaru and Fu go to fight. Um, so small little differences in terms of this part. Okay, 
but yeah, we're pretty much gonna just spam Hikaru's magic throughout this fight. <laughs> yep. And uh, there's a distinction between animal-type bosses and human-type bosses, whereas in animal-type bosses, uh, their invincibility frames run down while you're casting magic. And then we have human-type bosses where you have to wait for them for the invulnerability frames to pass into, until you can damage them again. And for the most part, it's really, it's really consistent, but the first boss we fought is the exception. And then we just wait for him to turn red, and that means he's, only, he's one hit from death. And sadly, Jiminy can't, handle, can't sustain this new form he was given. And so he collapses under his own weight, perhaps? I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> Basically, he just can't handle that form and just fades into nothing, I guess. It's, it's really terrible, but... Ziggots uh, raises a cruel bunch. And there in that cutscene, uh, there's Sarah crying to Kaltus. Uh, gives us a mean look. But eventually, she, if you talk to her after this cutscene, she, she apologizes for the way she acted. And Kaltus is like giving us words of wisdom of don't end up like him. We gotta, we gotta soldier on and finish the mission of saving the princess. But uh, in the course of this fight, uh, Umi proved the strength of her heart and uh, we get the first machine. Yep. So in each cutscene, uh, they show up as their, bee their, uh, their beast form, and then they transform into the giant robot Gundam style, and they go into like a, a little pendant on their uh, necks, I guess? Something like that. Something yeah. around there. Anime! Anime, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the pinnacle of 90s anime. And so... We'll get, we'll get voice acting here. Uh, wherever there's a cutscene with uh, Zaygat in his palace, uh, we, get a, we get voice acting. My and we'll see here as, as uh, Alcyone on the return. left. She's currently been turned to uh, Crystal because she failed in capturing us at the beginning of the game. Yeah, she failed twice. She uh, chased Aldina. after us when uh, Clef was giving us our magic, and then again at the end of the forest, and it was because of that that uh, Zaygat um, turned her into a crystal. Mm hmm. And now we get introduced to Kaldina, who's our, our next opponent. And that's Ascot's older sister. Ooh, Sarah's in the way. Usually she's not over there. So now we're going to swim to the next town now that the water has calmed down. Uh, you can try swimming up there uh, before, but there's two guards that block your path. One of the nice things about this game is uh, even though you do have three party members, you don't have to worry about them getting stuck on anything. <laughs> yep, only the party member you're controlling matters at all. And when you swap characters, they just swap to the position that you're currently at. There we go. I actually had a soft lock there a couple weeks ago where I jumped onto it and talked to the guard at the same time, and it just removed all control from my character. It was very bizarre. Uh, the code for this game is a little bit on the unstable side due to a good chunk of it um, becoming missing after the original release. Uh, working Designs had to uh, recode a lot of it along with their usual changes they made to games that they released in this time period. So uh, the US version is ar arguably harder than the Japanese one in terms of uh, the speed and damage that monsters do and their HP values are also higher as well. Mm -hmm. So Kaldina's here in town. Uh, her specialty is dance magic, and she's using that to hypnotize the villagers. And here we run into Ferio, who we actually met in the Forest of Silence, and he is wooing all the women. And Fu is pretty is not happy about that because she has a crush on him, <laughs> and it's shown here. And this is one of two cutscenes where the character we are matters, as you get pl placed where the character is standing rather than where than just getting placed in a, in a generic spot. So now we're gonna go uh, sleep at a story at, an, at a plot inn. <laughs> yeah, all inns are plot inns in this game, since you heal via the fountains. Yep. yep. So we're gonna take a nap. Uh, we're gonna get woken up in the middle of the night by the innkeep because something strange is going on in the town. If you want, we got a don't. You can have time for a donation. All right. Turn up the beat. Donates twenty-five dollars and says hello from the audience. <laughs> 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 and Anonymous donates $10 saying, Gotta get in for that Foo figurine. She's my favorite magic knight. Good luck, Shen Talk. 
Thank you. So, uh, Caldina, uh, the prophecy says that each of the machines is in the sea, the sky, and the air, or, and the volcano. So she's, this, this uh, volcano uh, erupted recently and turned Rosen into a frozen wasteland when it was originally, um, I guess, a more green place. And so like the entire environment has changed. So she's uh, hypnotizing people to dig through the volcano to try to get to the ancient machine before us. But little does she know that the ancient machine isn't here. <laughs> Spoilers. I know. <laughs> But how could there be two volcanoes in the world? That doesn't <laughs> There's only supposed to be one of every elemental dungeon in this RPG. And so Fario's offering his help, but Fu is like, no way. But, and then she realizes what she, uh, what, that she knew what she said was just awful and mean, and she wants to go apologize to him. So I, I think that's like the motivation for us coming in here, even though we were asked in the first place. So this dungeon is actually pretty unique. It's the only dungeon that's just one giant map, and it is maze-like because there's all these uh, tracks that you use to get around, and a good chunk, like there's these items called rainbow amulets that can be used to unlock bonus stuff in the game, and a good chunk of them are in this dungeon. But we're only here for uh, Umi's level two spell, which is used to get to the boss. Oh, there we go. So we just know exactly where to go. I'm gonna watch out for the sharks. Yeah, th this whole part is uh, venturing into the realm of this was never in the anime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say about two thirds of the game is sort of based on the anime and then the, there's like a whole third where you just go off on your own. You can roughly tell by the uh, animated cutscenes that uh, we do skip them, but most uh, most of those animated cutscenes are pulled from the anime. Um, there's, I think, one that is not that they made for this game, and you can kind of tell that the animation quality is a little bit better. Yeah, well, it's, it's at least a lot cleaner. Yeah. So we're just taking this little expressway to where we want to go. Uh, we can technically run this way as well, but it's about the same speed. <laughs> <laughs> No, don't jump this way. Good. So we have to kill this little bubble monster here. Um, this, there's basically like these four uh, oh, little thing, little torches we have to put out. But as long as that monster's there, it won't trigger uh, those torches being put out when we uh, cast our level two spell. And this is going to be our main damage source for a good chunk of the game now because it's faster than Yukaru's, even though it does the same damage. And we grab that mana upgrade there. Uh, there's not really any reason to, but it makes a fight later uh, much more consistent without having to rely on uh, accidentally failing the magic swap glitch. Like, it's pretty consistent. Do I have, I changed the mapping so that I can just use my thumb to press the Z and C button uh, really easily. Because by default, it's the R button that casts your, or that changes your magic. Or that changes your character, sorry. And I changed it to Y and Z. So here we find Ferio and find out that he actually was on our side and, you know, not uh, being a playboy. So uh, this is the Caldina boss fight. This is the first time we fight Caldina. Uh, we'll be fighting her again later because of the donation incentive that you all met. Thank you very much. Um, the gimmick to this fight is that you cannot reach her with uh, Hikaru and Umi's melee attack, so you must use magic. Or if you ran out of magic, you'd have to use a potion. There are mana and health potions in this game you can re use to uh, restore. Um, or you'd have to plink away at her with Fu's uh, bow and arrow, because the only other, it's the only other melee attack that can hit her. Yeah. But because of the magic glitch, we can just uh, stand there and spam water tornado until she's done. Yeah. Normally by this point, uh, Fu will have at least her charge attack. So if you do this casually, this fight's not too difficult. Because uh, with her charge attack, it's, a, it's basically three homing arrows. And it's pretty easy to hit her with those. But she does get in range. She has like an attack where she da she has like uh, like six mirages around you with one of them being real. And if you hit the correct one, she gets damaged. Otherwise, it just blows up on you. But using magic, it just removes any uh, worry about taking too much damage and having trouble with the fight. And so uh, every time we uh, view Zega, we have this uh, cutscene of his castle. It's it's kind of sometimes the cutscenes are kind of redundant. And here we find Alcyon has gone missing, 
Uh, there was a cutscene where she mm. breaks free from her crystal uh, um, prison. My little pet Alcyone has vanished. And normally we see her through several points in the game uh, as an adversary, but in the run we're only going to see her twice. Uh, if we have time, uh, yeah, have time for a donation. All right, we have a ten dollar donation from Miriyoki who says, I still need to get around to finishing the anime. <laughs> <laughs> Don't watch season two. I agree with that sentiment. <laughs> <laughs> and a $3 donation from Hikari Inu. Magic Knight Rayearth was and is still one of my favorite manga slash anime ever. I still have all the books and the entire first season on DVD. I never got a chance to play the Saturn game. Here's to a good run. All right, so now we're gonna we need we can we want to get to the next village, but we can't because there's a, a rock that's blocking our path from the volcano eruption. So we meet Rafarga, who just breaks through this uh, uh, ice wall. <laughs> and that's uh, that's one of the cutscenes you can uh, very clearly tell is different from the usual ones. Yeah. Because this is definitely not how you run into Rafarga in the in the anime. No. So he's gonna he's gonna try to teach us how to how to bust through walls with the pulverizing bash. Uh, Rafarga used to be, uh, was he the head of the Royal Guard or just a, just a Royal Guard member? I think he was the head of the Royal Guard. Okay, he was the head of the Royal Guard for uh, the prin for Princess Emerald, but against Zagat, he wasn't able to do anything against him. He was just basically frozen in place, <laughs> and he decided to exile himself because he, was a, he, was a, he failed protecting the princess. And he's actually going to go into that shortly. We're going to wake up in the middle of the night and have, a, have a, a chat with him about that. And we got time for a donation again, if there's any. We do have a long one if we have a little bit of time. Uh, yeah. All right, this is $125 from Gunarm Dine. Oh, no. <laughs> Punarm Dine here. Being an 80s kid, it's easy to say I pity the foo who isn't enjoying the scenery around here. Though, as is said in Chrono Trigger, mountains are nice. I actually grew up and graduated near the ocean, so you could say I attended Umiversity. <laughs> but I had to donate as Magic Knight Ray Earth, as it was one of my first anime, even though people are now threatening to call the Polizu over these puns. <laughs> Despite that, I won't ferry you all. I don't plan to jump at Shido's and will ask a staff member for a bodyguard if necessary. Bug. <laughs> if I do get attacked, I'll see on me on the evening news. Good luck and no pressure to Shentak on the run as your Mokono good choice to showcase this game. <laughs> and if the and villain tries to throw you to into the cleft of dimension, three. you're playing the you wrong game. <laughs> the pulverizing bash. So, na so now um, we, uh, we heard a scream, and it was Umi screaming speed. from the house. The it turns out that there was just a bug in her bed, well. and she was pretty freaked out about it. But thanks to that, we learned how to uh, break uh, weak walls. Sure and that's actually probably so the most useful ability in the game that we learn of the three that you get. Because there's a lot of brittle walls that's that you can break down. Boom! Boom. <laughs> Something I find amusing in that is um, when he first says boom, you can actually kind of hear him uh, hit either hitting his fist into his palm or snapping <laughs> or something that got caught in the uh, recording. And <laughs> <laughs> they just left it in because Working Designs likes to have fun with that. Um, you can unlock outtakes of this game after you beat the game on, your, on a save file, and it's like an extra little thing you can go into and listen to outtakes, and those are always hilarious to do. Yeah. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, some of them are they're truly hilarious. I just die laughing every time I hear them. Oh, NPCs in the way. There we go. So now, uh, basically, if you can get Pulverizing Bash before this cutscene, you still can't break down this wall because it's, it's technically a different version of Rosen in the game. Uh, in the Japanese version, there's some de leftover debug code, and you can get all the abilities early. And if you try to go up there before completing the dungeon, you, uh, the, the wall just technically doesn't exist. So now we're just going through um, a little halfway dungeon just to get to the next village. It doesn't act, there's no boss or anything, it's just a tough dungeon. Oops. Yeah, the music for this dungeon is a little too epic for what it actually is. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just gonna basically damage boost through it. If uh, there's no nations, go for it. This is just um, a, filler, a filler dungeon. 
we have a $200 donation from Waiter Pede. Good luck on the run, and shout out to Sam for reminding me to donate. Thanks. And we have a $10 do anonymous donation. Um, Dragon Crest, Ray Earth, and Earthbound? My day couldn't get any better if it tried. <laughs> well, I'm glad we at RPG Limit Break can make this, make this your day. <laughs> So um, there's these uh, brittle blocks here that you can take down with attacks, but you can also take it down with magic. There we go. So I'm trying to be careful with my HP. Uh, I can take, take a lot of damage, and it's pretty okay. Uh, there we go. I'm just gonna. Nope. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and heal with her. And switch. Oh, usually that's not one. That one's not there. Oh well. And swap. So now I just got to be a little bit careful. I think I'm I'm okay with letting Hukaru take another hit. Uh, she'll faint from it, but that's okay. Just got to be really careful. Okay, I'm actually gonna cast a spell here. Normally I don't, but they're being a little bit more aggressive than usual. Okay, there we go. All the danger's gone. That's probably the last dangerous spot in the game. Uh, generally, I'm, it's pretty safe, but occasionally the fireballs can just be mean. <laughs> yeah, that was not a very nice walk through this dungeon. Yeah. yeah casually, you're going to have a lot more HP, probably two to three more bars per character at this point, depending on if you've been picking up HP crystals or not, and just from the extra level ups that you get from the places we've skipped in the speedrun. Yeah. So we come here, and this town is on fire. And it's not just a normal fire, it's a magical fire. And we have to go into this mansion. There's, uh, if we talk to that lady over on the right, she says that her, her son is still trapped in the mansion. And we're going to go in and be uh, the heroes that we're destined to be. And so in this dungeon, we have to find three colored keys. They actually match each color of the girls. Uh, but we need them in order to get to the room where the kid is trapped. And we got lots of fire rats. And if we got a donation, we can go for it. This one is just pretty straightforward of just running through and grabbing keys. We do not, but All I do right. want to remind everybody, if you donate during this run, you have a chance to win that uh, Magic Knight Rare Foo figurine. All you have to do is donate $10, and you're in the running for that. So if you're having fun, want a chance to win something, that would be the way to do it. It's a lovely figurine. All right, so I got actually good luck on movement patterns for those rats. Uh, sometimes they can get in your way, and I'd have to re-get a running speed. Let's see, there we go. And then, oh, just barely made it past that. Ah, was so close to keeping my running speed. The more long you can keep running speed, the faster you move, of course. And we want to move as fast as we can, of course. Yeah, at this point in the game, since we don't have uh, we don't have that mechanic. You basically are stuck walking for quite a bit before oh, you can whoops. actually uh, before you can actually start to run. So every time Shentak gets hit, um, the running stops and it has to be restarted. Yeah, got a little ahead of it myself. I uh, got a little bit ahead of myself. I need to get one more key, which is the green key, in order to break that, in order to open that door. And it's just back down in the same room we were before. Just had to fall through a hole. Oh. Yeah, this dungeon's a little bit backtracky. You're kind of just going through this room here like three times, and uh, I personally tend to get lost in this dungeon just because I forget which you know which hole goes where and all that. But um, once you know the route, it's uh, pretty easy to get through. Just annoying with all the uh, sped up enemies running around. Yeah. So now they put a nice little fountain here right before the boss, and every dungeon's like that. It's wonderful. Uh, usually, it, it's all I'm usually going to use it because I'm always going to take damage somewhere. So now we're finally in the area where the kid is. And it turns out it's actually going to be the source of the fire. And hello, little kitty. And it turns out Alcyon was behind the fire. Even though she's been exiled by Zagot, or excommunicated by Zagot, she still wants to prove to her, him that she's useful. So this boss is in two phases. The first phase is just three little fire skulls, and we can just take them out real quickly. And this is why I grabbed the extra mana, so I can just cast them without having to worry about uh, having, enough, uh, having to do the magic glitch. And this is the only fight where 
the magic, the element of your magic actually uh, matters. If you use uh, Hikaru's magic, it won't hurt him. But Umi's magic seems to do like double damage, so we can just uh, kill him in as little as four hits, and that's one dead fire skull. <laughs> Uh, if you let him live, he uh, moves around the room pretty quickly and extends his arm around corners and drops uh, little fire bits around. So it's very easy to take a lot of damage and get kind of stun locked either by the boss cornering you and uh, hitting you with fire and then hitting you with his arm. So just being able to chain cast magic like that is very helpful. Yeah. And actually in the Japanese version, he has an extra attack if I recall. Oh. Yeah. It's like one where he just like uh, spits out multiple little bits of fire instead of just one at a time. And it's, it's, and I've only seen it in the Japanese version. I've never seen it happen in the U.S. version. Hmm. Maybe it's just something they overlooked when they were rebuilding the code. Because like after this game was released, they lost like half the code to like a hard drive failure. And Working Design spent a very long time uh, working on it. And this actually became the last game released in the U.S. because of that. And that's how actually I found out about it. <laughs> Yeah, the game came out in uh, 1995 in Japan and 1998 in the U.S. She not only departed without your permission. Yeah, it, it very much flew under the radar when it got translated, though, because like uh, I had absolutely no idea until I saw Shen Talk running it that there was an English version of this game. Yeah, it was a very limited release, like about 10,000 copies, I'm told. Like the estimates say, 10 between 10 and 15,000. But unnecessary. So you would be lucky to see one in a shop unless you pre-ordered it. Monitor her activities. Yeah, in general, the online community, at least for a while, um, really only knew of the... There's a Super Nintendo RPG, also titled Magic Net Rare Earth, or Mahokishi Rare Earth, um, that's only released in Japan, but a fan translation was done for it. So a lot of people say, oh, you're playing the Magic Net Rare Earth RPG, they think of the Super, Super Nintendo Super Famicom release, uh, not knowing that there was also a Saturn game that's completely different. And to make things even more confusing, there's a Game Gear, Mahokishi Rare Earth, as well, that's has, it's also titled the same. <laughs> and that one, I think, is a is a raising sim. Uh, no, that there is one that's a raising sim, but there's also one that's just a regular RPG. Mm. Although it's kind of weird because you have to do dice rolls to determine when what move you do. It's very bizarre. <laughs> so now we're going to the next area, Lyrie, where technically we learn how to learn the instant dash uh, technique, which will let us run a command. But we have we're going to skip that and just go uh, straight to the donation incentive fight, and uh, which uh, basically we're going to do something that lets skip two whole dungeons and it's just fantastic but at the same time it skips my favorite dungeon and my least favorite dungeon in one fell swoop because <laughs> I, I love the tree of the tree of life dungeon there's just so much good movement and it's the, the boss fight is very difficult there but it's still a rewarding fight all the same so uh the story here is that we're supposed uh, the, uh, the, ho like, the hospital is completely filled up everybody's sick uh, we magic can't really do anything but the tree of life has uh special properties on its leaves that can uh, heal any illness, but the tree of life is dying, and there's only one leaf left, and it's all the way at the top. And so we're tasked with getting that. But we're just we're not going to skip that. They're going to be fine on their own. It's going to be good. Yeah, the the NPC guy. I don't remember his name. The one that uh, uh. the one that wants to go on a date with Umi. Uh, he he goes and gets it just fine. Don't worry. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to do something called the uh, map glitch. There we go. Wow, first try. So we press the map button, and we just go up right, and we're just in between bounds, and we just go right back in the bounds. And that boulder there is supposed to be a story block. <laughs> Thank you. What did I say? First, first try map, first try boulder skip. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> so basically, I think it's like a four-frame window where you can press it. And if you press it, uh, it gives you the map sprites, but it displaces you. If we went up too far, we'd go tr entirely out of bounds. So, but because of that, we're just in between bounds. And we can move in between it if we're very careful. So this is the, the bonus incentive fight where we fight Kaldina a second time. It's technically the end of the second dungeon we skip. And here we have Ascot, who actually was with us for a little bit, uh, disguised as a kid named Alto. He wa wanted to see why we're, so, we're such good people, because he couldn't fathom uh, that. And uh, Kaldina had made a pact with Alcyon to ambush us. And so but Alcyon has double-crossed uh, Kaldina, and Ascot... Uh, understanding the ways of being good, sacrificed himself for, uh, to protect us. And Kaldina, in a fit of rage, is going to try to take us down. And uh, this time, she, we can actually attack her normally. She throws a fan around. Uh, she also can throw energy balls. And, I th ah. and those are basically our only two attacks. And I guess just her moving around is kind of dangerous because she can bump into you and do some damage. 
and after uh, two or three hits, depending on the phase, uh, she changes the arena, and every arena gets uh, increasingly difficult. Although I will say the one after this isn't too difficult because it's water instead of this damaged ground. So normally in the speed run, you can just walk past the exit to that cave and just head on to the next town without having to fight her. Um, when this glitch was originally found, we thought we had to fight her just to make sure the flags were aligning properly, but uh, we found out that um, you didn't have to. Shoutouts to uh, Mitjitsu, who found uh, pretty much all the glitches that we use in this run. Um, they're a, they're a well, kind of, I guess, well-known uh, Saturn Tasser. They've done the TAS of this game along with a bunch of other games as well. Yeah. And so this is the final room. Uh, it's definitely a difficult room to maneuver around in because you have to rely on these platforms. Let's see what you're going to do. So I have to wait for that fan to come out. Oh, there we go. And so she, she, we have defeated her. And so now we get uh, treated to a nice cutscene that sadly we have to skip. Uh, Kaldina uh, decides to take our help, but Innova, uh, Zagat's um, right-hand man, comes in and takes her out because of her failure. And also he wanted to assess uh, our strength. And so now we get treated to Alcyon. Uh, just gloating over uh, that she's d destroying or taking out uh, Zagat's uh, minions. And, so, and she wants to believe that once she's the only one left, that Zagat will fall for her. Yeah, despite being the first uh, of those enemies that you encounter, Alcyon is actually one of the main antagonists uh, for this game. And you encounter her quite a lot. Mm -hmm. She's just basically a thorn in your side. Bravo, <laughs> Now let's see what you're capable of, shall we? And now we're getting alluded to uh, an encounter we'll be having later. Yes, my lord. Yeah, Zagat has one more uh, evil henchman up his sleeve that he will send off after us. Yeah. And like, it, it, there's a voice for that character, but it doesn't really connect to who the person is because there's only one other scene in the game where you, or one other scene in the game up until this point where you hear that person talk. So here, I just need to mash A and C, and so we're still under technically the map glitch where it, it acts funky when you travel to a new area, and sadly, we weren't able to fix it. Uh, if we were to fix it, you'd see the, the overworld screen traveling to the other area, be, and it would look kind of funky as well. Uh, but by not fixing the map glitch, we have to go back to the Lack Attack Falls to connect the two points on the map, uh, because we need to go back this way when we do fast travel later on. And it's a lot. Fa it's still faster to connect the two points on the map than to go the other direction because the other direction, uh, while we can get there, uh, go we can go we can go to where we need to go. But on the way back, we'd have to go through several areas to uh, reconnect the, to connect those points on the map. So it's just faster just to do it here. But at least uh, it's pretty obvious when you get it right. It's like um, a frame perfect. Uh, it is. Or I should say it's like it is frame perfect, and I. It's just hard. It's not consistent, but you can generally get it like about 50% of the time if you just bash both A and C. So now we're going into a town that I'm pretty sure is nowhere in the anime or manga called Liquido. And they're having their own problems as well. Everywhere we go is just beset with trouble, just all because of Princess Emerald being uh, captured and, and imprisoned. Yeah, that is at least a common theme in the anime. Uh, every every town the girls do walk through has some kind of issue in, in the anime. Mm -hmm. So this town is being plagued by a giant beast that's roaming around at night and causing tremors. And we're going to talk to a little boy named Nero, whose mom has been affected by these tremors. Uh, a bookcase had fallen on her and broken her arm, and now he wants revenge. And uh, oh, due to, due to doing that map glitch and skipping uh, those cutscenes, it decides to play uh, like mouth motions, acting like there's voice acting here, even though there is none in the US version. Uh, it's probably just leftover legacy code from the Japanese version that gets loaded up. Uh, in the US version, they do remove the mouth movements uh, from the voice acting, but in the Japanese version, they do their best to try to sync up mouth movements to what's being said. There we go, and so now we're gonna stay another plot in. And there is currency in this game, but it's inconsequential. It's, uh, you can use it to buy potions or uh, modern health upgrades, but 
Aside from a few chests, money is quite difficult to acquire, uh, and items are quite expensive. Uh, a mana potion is 100, 100 uh, money, and uh, health potions 150, and then health and mana upgrades are, I believe, 300 and 250 respectively. So they're they're you really have to go out of your way and farm money for. And monsters can only drop one or five pieces, and and more often than not, they're only gonna drop one piece. So now we hear the tremors of the giant beast that's uh, roaming around. And we get uh, joyfully waken up by it. <laughs> <laughs> and then here's little Nero. He's going to tell us our plan. Yeah, he's going to go uh, defeat that monster because he's so angry that it hurt his mom. But uh, now we have to go chase after him to make sure he doesn't get hurt. Yeah. And uh, in the U.S. version, this is probably is going to be one of the more difficult... Uh, dungeons, uh, just because everything hurts a lot more in the U.S. version. About I think uh, double the damage on some of the monsters, and they move a lot more quickly as well. Uh, but that's going to be both to our advantage and deficit. Uh, we're going to be uh, basically this dungeon is separated into two parts, and we need to collect a medallion from each part. Yeah, that that's uh, kind of a working design specialty of making uh, enemies hit harder or uh, take more hits to die. Yeah, they make. Like, I, every, I don't think there's any single game they've done that they didn't make more difficult in some way. Mm. Not that I can think of. Growl Answer 2 and possibly 3. Oh, okay. I do believe those did not have any um, mechanical changes between them. Most of those changes were more like uh, okay, graphical. So, ah, okay, yep. So we, w we do want to take damage here, but we want to manage it. Ooh, that's not good. Uh, basically, at the end of each stage, uh, or at the end of each area, after we get the medallion, we want a death warp, and, and it'll take us back to the entrance of the of the dungeon section, and it saves us from just a lot of backtracking. Wow, that got super laggy for a second there. Yeah, it's, I think it's just because of those chimeras were, were coming on the screen. Yeah. And so this is uh, the only other time we use Fu's magic as a puzzle element. And, okay, yeah. Oh, that's unusual. Usually they don't hit me. Okay, so I'm going to swap. I want to keep Fu alive in case I need to heal. Uh, let's see. I think I'm going to heal out of safety. Yeah, these these sections are long enough that you don't want you want to um, get knocked out at the end so you get back to the beginning, but you don't want that to happen before you get to the medallion at the end. So you need to backtrack through uh, these maze-like areas all over again. Yeah. Oh, like I got stuck. Nice. Yeah, that one's always stuck. And there's like a tree there that if you hit it, it drops mites, and you're supposed to destroy it, but you can just damage right through it or walk past it as well. Uh, there we go. There we go. So I'm okay with taking damage now. Uh, I just want to get as low as I can. Uh, there, I used to have a pretty optimal damage route, but that was based on the original route with where you leveled up every single time. And with the new route, just take too much damage to make it safe. Because everything t halves your health. Uh, there we go. I'm just going to do that. And they expect you to have instant dash by this point, but luckily they give you enough uh, running uh, ground to get running speed at least. And just jump in there, grab the medallion. Yeah, so th there is a way you can do a sort of a quick run, because uh, the uh, the way you get running speed is based on the amount of like movement frames you've been doing. And if you sort of tap the uh, D-pad. Uh, to the sort of a beat of like the swings of your arms, you can get running speed very quickly. It's yeah. not really intentional, but um, if you have trouble getting uh, enough distance, you can do it a short run that way. Yeah. And it's really hard to do. I've done it a couple times, but it's not something I can do consistently because I just don't really have that kind of rhythm. But if we want to, if there's any donations, uh, it's just going to be more of the same in the second half, just more difficult. <laughs> All right, we do have several donations that have come in. We have $10 from Thomas L., who says, Thank you, RPG Limit Break, for helping me get through exam week, especially with the Sega Saturn game based on my favorite clamp story, but also the only working design Saturn game I don't own. Best of luck with the rest of the runs. We have a $25 do anonymous donation that says, I'm a jerkbird radical. <laughs> All animals, regardless of species, are jerkbirds. <laughs> <laughs> We have a $10 anonymous donation saying, awesome to see Sega Saturn represented. Quite a cool game that I never heard of. Thanks to the runner on the couch for the great commentary. Go RPG Limit Break. Smile, runner's choice. <laughs> and I do, I, I, I do have all uh, runner's choice going to the name incentive of Virtual Hide Light to be, uh, or sorry, Super Hide Light to be Brosentia. 
<laughs> oh, yeah. wow, I avoided that. Usually I get hit there, so nice. that's impressive. Yeah, this is one of... Like, in general, a lot of Sat Sega Saturn games are on the expensive side, uh, just because of the um, length of time the console was active and uh, the general scarcity of releases. Uh, this is one of the most expensive Saturn games. It's uh, going for about... The English version goes for about $400 right now. Yeah. Which hurts, because you can get the Japanese version for like 15 ten. bucks. Yeah, 10, 15 bucks. bucks. And it even comes with a nice little art book. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to switch to her. So this last section is incredibly difficult. There's, there's a lot of these Chimera-type enemies. Let's see. Can change magic. And technically that pink tree you're supposed to set on fire to destroy, but you can just damage boost through it. Yep. Let's see. I can't get running speed here. That's good. The yeah. first two didn't chase you. Yeah, I was surprised about that. I think they got caught on the wall. Usually all three of them will chase me down. So I'm just going to take damage and death warp back to the beginning of the stage. And then now that we have both medallions in hand, we can just uh, finally fight the boss. There we go. So in the Japanese version, it takes a lot longer to take enough damage to death warp. Uh, they, they only do like two points of damage, and they move incredibly slow. So it just makes the du it makes the this dungeon uh, much more simple in the Japanese version. And I think of the working designs games I play, this is probably the one they balance the best because the Japanese version is kind of easy in a boring way. Up and and this one is like fairly balanced all the way until the end. The last couple of fights are extremely difficult like it's just like it's you know pretty solid pace upwards then suddenly it's just a big uh, boost in difficulty so now we place the medallions and uh, this island we're on is shaking and it turns out it's not an island at all as we're on the back of a giant turtle uh, I don't know if it's a sea turtle. They don't really specify. It's, it's only it's only unique to the game. Yeah, you don't really see his feet. Yeah. It's, oh, well, yeah, that's true, actually. Or you do in a cutscene, but it's kind of blurry. Because <laughs> is it a turtle or a tortoise? <laughs> and here we finally find Nero on top of the beast's head. So now we're just going to take him down like normal. Uh, before the, the last two dungeons were skipped, we actually used Umi's charge attack. And this was the only fight where Umi's charge attack did the same amount of, da same amount of damage as uh, her magic. And it was technically faster because uh, you, just, you weren't stuck waiting for frames. But uh, since we skipped those two dungeons, now her attack's much weaker. Yeah, every time you see them go through those that uh, magical girl transformation scene, uh, they get stronger. And Umi tends to go through a lot more by this point in the game than the others do. And at this point, uh, I believe Umi's the lowest level out of the three characters. Yeah, I believe so. Um, does she level up on this fight? Or no, oh, no. We got uh, Poo -poo. Yeah. <laughs> Makona's trademark sound. And now we're communicating with the giant turtle. Turns out that the turtle wasn't such a bad guy. Uh, basically what happened, is he was, he was resting there for a long time and uh, had some growth on him, which was all those trees and stuff. And was just trying to shake it off, but was just causing a lot of tremors due to his immense size. But he's gonna be our, our new ally. He's gonna act as our taxi service to the city in the sky called uh, Aurora, I believe. And it's kind of hard to pronounce, or it's kind of hard to pronounce just based on how it's spelled. But Nero realizes that revenge is not the answer, and he, he wants to aspire to be like the Magic Knights. Oh, they, that's, they were just referring to him as the Spirit Beast. Okay. Yeah, some of the NPCs in the next town say that there's only uh, two ways to get to that, that town, is either by riding on a Spirit Beast or using magic. That makes sense. It's just been so long since I talked to the NPCs. <laughs> the only reason I know is because I was doing it the other day when you were when you were off and I was just playing around with the game. Oh, okay, cool. 
So now we're finally in the Sky Garden of Aruria. I, got, I feel like I'm butchering the name every time I say it. And this is probably one of my favorite city tracks in the game, although uh, uh, Taflon is definitely uh, is also a good contender. So now we want to go talk to the mayor of this city, and we want we want to go to the Heaven's Labyrinth where the next ancient machine is, and we want and we need a key to get there because he decided to lock the gate, but he decides that no one's allowed to see the statue and just throws us out with his uh, trusty uh, bodyguard Hans. Hans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, people of this town worship the uh, statue as like their their um, goddess, I believe. Yeah, I think they have a don't. I think they have a different name for it, but I can't recall. But we we decided we're just gonna go sleep on it, and maybe he'll be in, maybe the mayor will be in a better mood tomorrow. And this is the only uh, of the ends. This is the only one where we don't get a we don't get an extra cutscene for sleeping there. We finally get a full night's sleep. Yeah. And Inzer's free to sleep at, which is just fantastic. And we're intentionally as Fu for this section because she's going to be used for. Uh, she has a cutscene where she's going to be the closest when when she gets out of it, she'll be the closest to where we're going next. And also, uh, each character has unique dialogue when they interact with objects, and she's the only one that's going to have the dialogue that allows to progress the story when uh, uh, when we get there. So he, so the key has been stolen, and he think he thinks we we did it, even though we come to him to ask for the key again. So his logic is that there we asked, so therefore we stole. And he's just gonna throw us in a makeshift dungeon of his, uh, the I guess that they made. Yep, and we're gonna come upon the obligatory sneaking around. Mm -hmm. And if you have any donations, we have a, just like a short, uh, like a about thirty second cutscene. All right, I have a fifty dollar donation from Oro. Magical Night Ray Earth, more like Magical Night Bay Earth. <laughs> 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 and we have a $10 donation from Katuria. Here's $10 from the first ever blind gamer to attend Limit Break. This message comes with Vulagine and Heroic Spirit Gamer's approval. I will donate another $20 if Tech will play Eris' death scene from Final Fantasy VII after this run. Please crank it up nice and loud. I love this event and everything you do. Game on. <laughs> Woo! Thank you, love you guys. <laughs> so Fu, uh, she has rudimentary lock picking skills, and uh, the, the the lock is very primitive. So now we're going to be sneaking through here because uh, I guess it's mandatory for an RPG to have a sneaking section. Oh, got caught on the wall there. And uh, everything's on a room cycle, so when you enter the room is when they start moving. Okay, there we go. And then we're just gonna move past this guy. And they have they have a decent range. If you bump into them as well, they can also throw you in jail. And now we're in the second room. We're gonna try to uh, skip a couple of uh, guard cycles to save some time, and hopefully we can get it. It's kind of tricky because we have to sneak right next to a guard, and it's really easy to bounce into them with uh, how slippery movement is when you're running. So I'm running into the corner here because uh, when you run into corners, you don't lose your Movement speed that saves me just for having to do this. Oh, it was just a little bit too slow. So I'm only going to try that once because every time you get caught, you get another cutscene back in here and waste a significant chunk of time. So I'm just going to do it normally, and which is too bad because it's doing it the fast way is really fun. So if you uh, have any other donations, go for it. I'm just going to be going through this again, and it plays a cutscene every single time. Well, I definitely want to add to that last one. Katuria, we are 1,000% going to play that song for you. So thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a $10 donation from Hikaru-chan. I grew up watching Magic Knight Rear through when I was little and have been a Clamp super fan ever since. I have the whole series on DVD, but never had a chance to play, so I'm happy to see this game being played here. I have to put a donation for a few reasons for helping give towards Nami, for a chance to win that Foo figure, and to agree that the second season of the anime wasn't as good. <laughs> <laughs> Sad faces. The second season of the anime deviates heavily from the second half of the manga. The manga is uh, six volumes total. The anime is 40-something episodes, I believe. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, it deviates quite heavily, including all the way up to the ending and, you know, who's alive, who isn't, and uh, even what characters. There's a whole extra character in the anime that they add in. Oh, wow. Yeah, they just went the wrong way with that second season. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're just going to do this the, the, way, the intended way, basically. We wait for this guard. And then there's like a little alcove there that we're gonna hang out in. Uh, they're very they, they, the guards can see very far, but they're narrow sighted, or near uh, yeah narrow sighted. So we're just gonna wait for him. And if we were if we were to sneak past him, we could get past this really quickly, and we wouldn't have to wait on cycles on this guard as well. So we just have to wait for him to start walking back. And there we go. Just gonna wait for him a little bit longer. Uh, okay, there we go. See, and just like that, we just stand right there. He doesn't even notice we exist or that the other characters are floating around. Oh, there's Umi. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to go check this chim chimney, and only Fu can, can deduce that there's footprints there, that someone came through the chimney and stole the key. So uh, we're just going to climb through the chimney at, uh, Umi, at the protest of Umi because she doesn't want to ruin her hair. And once we get to the top of the, top of the chimney, we find Ferio's flute, of all things. Uh, it makes us question why it's even there. Yeah, if we walk around town before going here, we do run into Ferio, um, kind of getting close with another girl who seems very into him. Mm -hmm. And we're actually going to go have talk with Ferio about this flute. And he's going to be pretty unresponsive to us. Well, he's busy. Yeah, he's busy with his new with his new uh, gal. He's so busy he couldn't even take a shower. Yep, and he's covered it. He's covered <laughs> in soot. And this woman that, that he's with it looks very familiar, but we don't really see the see the resemblance. But it'll it'll come to light later. And she's wearing a hat. It's obviously a different person. <laughs> Completely different. O only way it'd be more of a disguise if it, she had glasses on. And then suddenly Rafarga's here for some reason, set up in his armor and wearing what looks to be uh, battle paint. So he suggests that why not wait by the gate and see whoever stole the key. They're definitely going to show up since, you know, they're going to need to use the key at some point. I believe if you talk to Rafarga uh, when he first come into town, he kind of, I think he talks about like he got his resolve back and he's going to try to find a way to uh, get to Zagato's castle and uh, try to help you out. Yeah, he, we, we've inspired him to take up arms again. So here we're just waiting around, just see a bunch of people walking by and, and an elderly gentleman uh, praying to the statue from afar since uh, it's just locked away. And here we finally see Ferio coming up with, with key in hand. And his mysterious woman. And here they go in together, hand in hand. And now we're going to actually skip this dungeon in, in an interesting way. This is the only, uh, it'll be the only point in the game where we do, um, I, I'd like to call it ROM work because I don't really know what else to call it. Um, what we're going to do is we need to get running speed, and then we want to jump into uh, this transition screen in a certain way. I'm not going to be able to do it the first the first time I jump into it because I don't have a way to instant dash. So I'm just going to go into the next screen while jumping just to keep my momentum. Jump across, jump back across. And then if we do it right, uh, nope, that's too uh, late. Here we go, that, that looks correct, there we go. So now we loaded a different portion of the dungeon's collision and it lets us just walk around and go straight to the end of the dungeon. Normally this is a long dungeon with a lot of uh, moving platform cycles you have to wait on and uh, casually it's actually a really, really interesting dungeon with uh, a lot of paths you can take. But in a speed run, it's pretty boring because it's just waiting on platform cycles and we have to get an ability that, you know, that requires eight mana to cast. Yeah, you get Fu's third and final magic in this dungeon, which is just a protection spell that uh, protects you, lets you float over gaps, and also protects you from damaged floors. You, there's a couple dungeons that you get to backtrack to if you're going for 100% completion that uh, needs that protective wind. Uh, we also skipped Umi's third spell back in the waterfall dungeon. That's correct. Just an ice arrow spell that's only used once to destroy some skeletons, and otherwise it does the same amount of damage as her tornado spell. Yep, and has about I think it's about the same amount of animation frames, yeah. too. And now here we find Ferio, we find out he's under mind control, and he's coming to assault us under uh, uh, Alcyone's uh, order. And here we find Rafarga and find out he's actually under Zagat's mind control, which is much more powerful. And now we're trying to snap him out of it. 
And in doing so, he tries to fight it, but he ends up walking off the, the edge of this floating island. And now we have to deal with Alcyon before we have a chance to grieve. But she's not going to fight us herself. She's going to send in her own Jerkbird, which uh, used to be a very luck-heavy fight, but has been has been we found a way to manipulate. Uh, I don't know if it's exactly manipulate, but break the AI of this boss by standing over here. And instead of him doing his normal pattern, he's just going to fly around in a circle and let us uh, wail on him. It's very bizarre. Normally, this fight, uh, the birds like darting all over the map and and throwing like random feathers on the ground and trying to blow you off as well. Luckily, if you if you fall off, you just get spawned back on, but with one less hit point. But this way, it just makes the fight super consistent and easy. <laughs> and <laughs> oh, there we go. And so you see what happens when you fail the uh, magic glitch. You just you still you waste the mana, but nothing get, nothing comes out. You, you hear you hear the. Uh there we go. You hear the voice clip of the character you uh, switched from, and it's like they're casting their magic, but nothing happens because you're still switching characters. Yeah, and magic can occasionally bug out like that as well. I've had it happen where it'll act like you're casting it and you just kind of dance around. It's really strange. <laughs> How specific is that spot you have to stand in? Uh, it's pretty generous. Uh, it's like anywhere around that area. Um, I think it's just like maybe like one tile over that you can do. But I, I, I just use, there's like a little circle that I use as a visual cue just on where to stand. And so now we finally get Wyndham, the second uh, ancient machine, which is for Fu. And it's a giant green robot that has a bow and arrow. And his uh, beast form is a giant bird as well. Mm -hmm. He's not a jerk, though. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe a jerk to say got hot. And yeah, like all the cutscenes in this game, are, except for one, I guess, is pulled from the anime. So now we get another cutscene with Zega and company. Well, I think Inova is the only Cast one left at this point. <laughs> <laughs> His will was much stronger than we had anticipated. Yeah, so interestingly, the, uh, the thing that looks like war paint on Rafagra's face is actually part of the mind control and magic, and uh, when fail. it fades away in the cutscene, it actually I vanishes from exactly his face. Yeah. My liege. So now Innova is finally mobilizing to take action against us. So now we're gonna do a little. We're gonna we're gonna go search for Rafarga because he's like, there's no way he could he could he could die from that fall even though we're up on a floating island. Oops. Yeah, if you mash too fast uh, in dungeons after after between cutscenes, you can end up trying to cast magic. Yeah. Or attacking or moving around even a little bit. We had a, we had a little delivery there. This is the uh, Foo figurine that you can win if you donate uh, $10. Complete in box, even with all the little cards and everything, and got some nice pictures on the back and whatnot. She comes with uh, comes with her sword. Uh, she does have a sword in the anime instead of a bow. That's really amazing. Yeah, thank, uh, thank Professor Ness for donating this awesome, awesome item. Thank you, Professor Ness, and best of luck to whoever wins it. Or all donating for it. Yes, thank you, for everyone, for your donations uh, all throughout the marathon so far. So now we're in the Whispering Woods, where only a lone man lives. And he, he used to have a wife, but apparently she had passed away some time ago, and there's a gravestone that marks that. We finally find Rafarga, but he has amnesia due to the resisting the mind control. And the only, way, the only reason that he's still not under mind control is because of amnesia. So we need to do a little backtracking. We're going to go to the back to Lyrie and get some medicine that uh, was made from the Tree of Life leaf that we conveniently didn't have to get. Someone else got it for us. Uh, oh, Abner, that's the, that's the guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he has a crush on Athena, which is the leading nurse of the hospital. And we actually give it to him in the story to give to her to, you know, um, get some bonus points with Athena. But even though we didn't help, they're still going to be nice enough and give us the, uh, the potion that we need to help uh, restore his memory. Because uh, the potion is said to heal anything, including amnesia, apparently. Yeah, in video game terms, um, 
we're very thankful that this flag uh, st is a trip to this way. Yeah. Instead of instead of staying in the previous state of not rescuing the leaf and you know making us do the entire dungeon that we uh, skipped before. Yeah, it's fantastic. And Athena uh, knows that Abner didn't get the leaf, but it was thankful that we were we were nice enough to help him out. So now we get to go back to the Whispering Woods. If we didn't connect uh, Lack Attack and Liquida, we'd have to go all the way around and actually go through a couple of uh, areas to get back here because it's not technically not connected going in reverse because we have to go to the Rainbow Junction Shop, which is where you can exchange these Rainbow Amulets for bonus items. And some of them are neat and some of them are just novelty. Like there's one where you can have shoes that make uh, the sound of uh, make Makona's sound every footstep and it's it's cute at first, but it gets uh, grating pretty fast. Yeah, the other interesting items are there's a magic jewel that uh, restores your magic slowly when you're standing still. And uh, there's an escape gem that lets you escape from dungeons. Um, yeah, so Rafarga finally has his memory back, but now he has a massive headache as he's still trying to fight off the mind control. And he just walks off into the woods. <laughs> into a conveniently placed open area. Yeah. And you can access this area earlier, but there's nothing here until this fight. And here, Inova makes his appearance again, and Rafarga is now mobilizing for battle. And Alcyon decides to show up too. And in this cutscene, she shoots some ice arrows at us. Or actually, she shoots them at Rafarga, who reflects them back to Alcyon, and Alcyon takes a, a fail blow. And now we have to fight Rafarga, who's no longer able to resist mind control. Yeah, Alcyon wants to be the one to defeat us so she can get into Zagat's good, good, uh, good graces. This is the first human enemy we fought in a while. Yeah. Yep. So if you remember from earlier, we have to wait for his invincibility frames to wear off. As well as um, when he is swinging his sword around like that, he is also invincible. So we have to wait until the magic starts being cast. Yep. before doing our own spell back at him. Because if you cast it too soon, he'll actually wait in, until you finish casting before he becomes vulnerable. There we go. And uh, when he gets lower in health, his armor turns red and he tends to favor casting magic more often. But we try to hope that he doesn't because it just takes longer since we have to wait for him to finish the cast. But there's nothing you can really do to manipulate him. He just does whatever he wants. And sometimes they'll just chain it like this. There we go. And I think this should be the last hit. Nope, one more. Oh, that was the last hit. <laughs> <laughs> he's had to finish his animation, I guess. But what's interesting is if you cast a spell after he's already, um, after we've already defeated him, sometimes his after image stays flare. And so he's asking us to. Uh, kill him so that he dies as a, as himself rather than under mind control. But Innova, being the cruel person he is, just uh, outright takes him out. And we end up uh, having, we end up burying him and leaving a gravestone in memory of him. And there's a lot of death and sadness in this story. It's it's really sad, but it's for the, it's for rescuing the entire country it's, or the loss of the few to save the many, I guess, would be like the best way to describe it. Yeah, these these girls have been through a lot, and they just need to keep uh, pushing forward in order to reach their goal yeah. for the uh, for the sake of everyone around and for the sake of everyone they've lost as well. And now we see a volcano in the distance erupt, and uh, Hikaru gets a feeling that that's where her uh, that's where Ray Earth is, the final uh, ancient machine. So now we go back to Polyzoo Village, and. It's been turned to ash by the volcano. It's just completely destroyed. And the music here changes as well uh, to, to the, like, the adventurous overworld music. And everything is just burned to a crisp. So now we're going to change the Karu. So now we can go this way. Before, this way was blocked off. Uh, and it's actually, for the namesake category, no polyzoo skip. Uh, there's, in this town, there's a map glitch you can do at a series of very, very, very specific movements to get past that barrier and go to the Lair of Truth at the very beginning of the game. It, it ends up being like an under 20 minute run if done optimally. 
Uh, but it's extremely difficult because you only have three HP and, and just one hit will take you down. Yeah, plus when you do the map glitch after the cutscene that you're able to do it in, you're kind of bumped completely off screen and you have to do a lot of navigation uh, without being able to see where you're going. And here we have Hikaru's dog, which made an appearance at the very beginning of the game. And we learn uh, Hikaru's uh, ultimate spell. It's, it's an amazing spell. It, it's, it costs 10 mana to cast, but it'll defeat any boss with three casts. But we only have nine mana, so we technically can't, can't cast it. But with the help of the magic glitch, uh, we can just take any boss after this down in three hits. There we go. So uh, if we can we can uh, reset our momentum while keeping running speed if we just press the opposite direction. We use that to jump across that gap to avoid having to do some platforming. Jump. So this may not seem like it, but this is the final dungeon in the game. Yep. Oh, lag. So normally we can't go this way with these blocks here, but conveniently there's a little gap that was left in somehow, and we use that just to squeeze on through. And it saves us from having to do some tricky platforming at the other end of the dungeon. Well, these snakes are just uh, chasing you today. Oh yeah. So now we're gonna try to get, uh, I guess maybe maybe not happening, we're trying to get an early cycle on some platforms. So we got this cycle at least. I don't know if this, the room cycle resets when we take the teleporter here. And there's a few teleporters you can take, but this one is the uh, quickest since there's a lot less lag. Nope. Okay. I had I had I had I made it in time, but I didn't have any momentum to get the early cycle there. Uh, so we just have to wait a little bit longer. If there's any donations, and go for it since I had to wait for a couple cycles now. We have plenty of donations that have been coming in. We have a ten dollar donation from M-0, which is a variety of hearts. Um, we have a ten dollar donation from Chin Tess. Remember, boom! <laughs> a ten dollar donation from Sylvia S7. This game is adorable. Thank you for showing it off at RPG Limit Break. Uh, we have a ten dollar donation from Tara with no comments, and an anonymous ten dollar donation. They say, "Nice to see the prequel to show Super Robot Wars TV." <laughs> <laughs> So now we're just uh, going through this little part, and we're going to be coming up to the, to the next boss really soon. Um, look, luckily, in the next room, there's a healing fountain. There we go. And we want to be as foo since we're just going to be magic swapping to Hikaru, and it's easier just to swap to the, uh, the character on the right, and I guess technically, since it's normally L and R as your character swaps. And here we finally find Ray Earth, uh, the final machine and the namesake of the anime and the, and the manga. And here we find Alcyone, who has made her way here, uh, but she is bleeding to death uh, from the fatal wound she got earlier, and she refuses our help to help heal it, because uh, basically she found out Zagot's actually in love with Princess Emerald, and that's why that he kidnapped her, to save her from her uh, duty. And she's uh, Alcyon's a very difficult fight. She has a, she has a, a lot of attacks, and she likes to stay off the screen quite a bit. Uh, there we go. And we can't damage her when she's off the screen. But thanks to this ultimate magic we got. Ooh. Okay. So we have to wait for a reduced attack. You, so usually I'm pretty lucky in that she won't do an off-screen attack like that. But we can just do it again when she lands. And now she's down for good, sadly. I feel like she could have made a good ally, ally if she wasn't so insistent on her evil ways. Yeah, she she actually was uh, one of Clef's uh, main apprentices before she went to her for Zagat. Yeah. And now we're lamenting all over all this uh, death and suffering that has, has, ca has been caused by us interfering in the affairs of this world. But... There's far more going on if we didn't do anything. And so we finally get our final ancient machine, and we can now rush to the end of the game, and where Clef tells us what to do next. <laughs> if there's a donation, we got time for a couple. We had a $100 donation from Pat, who just said Jeff, and that <laughs> is for one of the Name the Kids incentives for upcoming round Earthbound. And then we had a follow-up donation from Wowitz Frank saying... $25, shoutouts to Pat who shouted out Jeff. <laughs> <laughs>
So now we see Zagat's um, one last time. He's going to have a conversation with Inova, and we find out that Inova is actually not human at all, Master if it couldn't Zagat, be told by his long ears. Uh, he's actually He actually was a spirit beast that was a protector of Emerald's castle, but Zagat had given him human form to work for him. So he, and he's a fiercely loyal spirit beast who will do anything Zagat says to please him. And uh, there's actually one of the unlockables is uh, his diary, which uh, goes into great detail of how loyal he truly is to Zagat. I mean, from all the different ways he says, my lord and my liege, he is very, very loyal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even, even Zagat has uh, second thoughts really kind of about uh, giving Unova back his original form for this next part coming up. Yeah. So uh, since this is considered a dungeon, we cannot fast travel over here, and we have to go back to Polyzo Polyzoo Village. And now we get to go to Precia's man Manor, which was our entry point in the game if we were to not skip the intro cutscenes. Uh, it's basically our... We meet Precia, who gives us uh, gives us our Scudo weapons and tells us where to go next. But I guess in the anime, she uh, dies early on. Yeah, Does after yeah. we uh, get the Escudo and bring it to her, she gets attacked and her house gets collapsed. I think Alcyon does it. That Someone sounds, does it. Sounds like it's something Alcyon would uh, do. No, I think it's uh, I think it's Ascot. I think he sets a. Uh, some kind of a beast or a curse on One him. of his pets or something, yeah. yeah okay. Collapses her house and uh, Precia's unfortunately inside and we have to uh, we have to leave her behind there while she uh, is unfortunately trapped. All right. Uh, luckily, we didn't take any... Uh, we did take a little damage and this is, the, this is the only fight in the game where you don't recover health after finishing it. And I believe it's just because you don't get a, a level up as you normally would. But it's hard to say because there's actually other instances like that. So if you notice in the back, uh, there's Makona sitting in the chair. Uh, that's actually a visual glitch from not doing this section of the game. Normally, Makona's in the chair, tossing papers around, and when we enter, uh, Makona turns around, scares us, we get on that uh, square platform below and get trapped in, in a cell for being intruders in her house. And she eventually lets us out when we convince her that we're the Magic Knights. Because uh, the door just opened into her manor, even though she had it locked. And that's kind of the proof that uh, we were the Magic Knights. Mm-hmm. So normally that chair is turned around and empty, but because we never did that cutscene, Makona is still in the chair and with us at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Another another good uh, showing of a, a flag that uh, gets overridden by a later one. I think there's another one I found, but it's not something you'd see in the run. I can't remember where. I know I saw it la like during the event. All right. I just can't remember the life of me where it was. But... So now we're finally back at the very in the very first point we enter the game where we came in contact with Clef and where he gets turned to stone. And so here we find Clef sitting here as a statue. And we go and find him and he's still in stone even though Alcyon has passed away. It's because she called upon Zagat's magic to uh, turn him to stone. So the only way to free him is to defeat Zagat himself. And here Inova finally reveals his true form as like a wolf type spirit beast. And he's immensely powerful in his in his original form. But like any boss, uh, after, uh, this boss and the next and the next boss, we're just gonna defeat them in three hits. Uh, Innova has an enormous amount of HP casually. I think it's like around 160. Uh, and it's kind of his HP is kind of weird because it goes down to a certain point, then it resets back up. As like was found out in, in memory. So Ferio there jumps in and uh, threw his sword to break Inova's horn, which uh, depowers him enough that we're able to uh, fight him on a more equal level. Yeah. And this is the only boss in the game with variable invincibility frames. So sometimes he can be really quick to get attacked again. Sometimes we have to wait a little bit. It's very bizarre. So like here, it's just like a little bit longer. Oop, there we go. There we go. And just like that, he's, we've taken him out. Okay, switch back to Fu. So now we're finally going to summon our ancient machines as in their, in their original forms. But everyone's going to be seeing us as we enter the point of no return. And they actually you know, are nice enough to give you a little dialogue to say that once you go past this point, there is no returning to the rest of the game. So you can, if you, there's more you want to do, you still can. And we only have to talk to Ferio here as he's the one blocking our path to uh, Clef. 
who tells us, uh, are you ready to summon your machines and uh, storm Zagat's castle? Because uh, Zagat's castle is camouflaged so that no one can find it, and there's also an immense barrier around it. So by summoning all three uh, ancient machines at the same time, it disrupts the camouflage and allows us to uh, attack and destroy the barrier and storm his castle. And you actually get some really neat cutscenes there, also with a, a, a mixture of cheesy 90s uh, CG. Yeah, you finally get to see uh, the three knights' uh, final armor as well. So in addition to the swords kind of growing in power throughout the game, uh, every time they do the magical girl transformation, the armor grows and changes as well until they reach this uh, particular form of the armor here. Mm -hmm. And also, for whatever reason, Fu no longer needs to wear glasses in cutscenes, but her original sprite still stays the same. <laughs> it's magic. <coughs> And now, we've <clears throat> and now we finally reach Zagat. And he's asking us, why does the princess need to pray? And we were confused by the question, so we decided to take him down. Whoops. And so Zagat, he doesn't have invincible A frames like normal. As long as when he ever has um, his uh, aura around him, we can't attack him. Uh, there we go. This fight is very, very laggy, so sometimes it's really easy to drop inputs. Whoops. Just like that. <laughs> there we go. So a little bit of sloppiness, but still um, a really easy fight this way. Uh, casually is kind of challenging. Uh, he moves around a lot, can do some decent chunks of damage. And so now he's going to summon his, uh, his own... Uh, ancient machine that he calls Eternal Spiral. And now we're going to be changing genres from an action RPG to a shmup. Sorry, Marathon. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, shmup limit break, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, now Fu is going to be our strongest damage dealer. Uh, her individual arrows are, are weak, but she has a unique ability that she can hit him multiple times. So we can defeat him in, in as little as five hits. Let's see. Yep, he's, he's going to summon bees. So I'm just trying to be really careful here. I don't want Fu to die. Yeah, so he has a few attacks here, um, and he is... After you attack him, he's invulnerable until he attacks again. So you can't just kind of spam your attack. He's got the bees attack, which he summons these little bee drones that can uh, fire lasers at everyone. Um, he has a sword swipe attack that's pretty powerful, and he also has that charge attack. He can also block your attacks by um, putting his arm in front of him as such, and that shield can be destroyed. Uh, originally when we ran this game, we just we spammed on that shield to destroy that shield first, and then attacked him. Um, other than Fu's attack, Hikaru is actually the strongest one here. She gets a Ooh. super main character power, so Fu unfortunately got knocked out. We're going to use Hikaru's sword attack here. Okay, there we go. There we go. So, it, oops, sorry. Takes just an extra hits. You just have to be careful not to get too close. His um, hit hurt box, rather, is a little uh, interesting. And we can uh, kind of guard with Umi there. Ooh. Getting a little hairy. Luckily, uh, this game is pretty safe about uh, game overing that you just restart the fight. Let's see, he's going to swipe. And this is like one of my favorite battle tracks. It's just it's so epic. <laughs> and uh, like almost all the tracks in this game are done off the Saturn sound chip, so there's a very few tracks that are actually CD audio. It just shows how amazing the Saturn sound chip really is. is I think it's just an, like a, a new version of the Yamaha chip using the Genesis. All right, and we got it. It wasn't too bad. Nice. And uh, usually you'd have a few more magic casts there if you're playing casually. Um, each girl has an attack they can use. Um, Hikaru has those long flames that are good for screen-wide attacks. Uh, Umi and Fuzu kind of spiral around wind and water, respectively. They don't do um, they do okay damage. They're nothing special, though. All right, so now Zygot's finally been defeated once and off, once for all. We can go save Princess Emerald. And here, Clef is finally free from his uh, stone imprisonment. 
And he says, we have to go by ourselves. He's not allowed to enter. Only only the Magic Knights are allowed to, in, to enter to save the princess. And here she is, finally freed from her prison. But she's uh, very upset that we killed Zagot because Zagot was her one true love. And if you want to talk, talk about it some more. Yeah, so because um, Emerald is the pillar of Sephiro, she's not allowed to really have any feelings because any unstable feelings um, will make Sephiro unstable. So when she fell in love with her priest, uh, Zagat, um, Sephiro started to become unstable. So they hatched up a plan together to say that um, that Zagat betrayed her and captured her and summoned the, and they needed to summon the magic knights to uh, destroy Zagat. But in the end, actually, Emerald wants us to destroy her as well. Mm -hmm, because otherwise she's just going to destroy the world out of grief. And she has her own super robot as well that is incredibly powerful. Too powerful for us three alone. But with the help of Makona, we're, we're going to be transforming into a giant Megazord type robot. <laughs> <laughs> or form that's, Voltron. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's about the only way you can describe that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, once... Uh, em Emerald knows that once when she's gone that uh, they will be able to find a new pillar for Sephiro. Yep, and, that's, and the only way we can return home is to defeat Emerald. And Emerald boss fight is similar to Zagat's, except that she has multiple damage points, but we only need to damage her head. Uh, you can damage her other points of her body to make the fights easier. And she always has the same powder attack. She's going to start out with uh, that, and then she's going to do laser eyes, and then she's going to do these shoulder things that hurt. <laughs> and then she's going to shoot out these little sparklers that are really easy to avoid. And then she has that coming out of her chest. We're just going to play a little safe. Yep, and then repeat. We thought originally we had to destroy every part of her for her to win, but um, yeah, she just had to destroy the head. And uh, here is the magic attack of the combined... Um, and time is coming up soon. Yeah, time is when the final hit of the boss here. So I did that magic attack just for some moment of frames because I don't want to don't want to die this fight. Uh, ooh, that's not good. Okay. And time. <laughs> and that is Magic Knight Ray Earth. What was my time? Your time was one thirty six twenty two point five. Very nice, nice, considering the donation incentive. Uh, shout out to Karaoke and the RPG Chick. Thank you so much for doing commentary with me. And shout out to Nori and Turnip uh, earlier for their donations. They're very close friends of mine. And shout out to Pun Arm Dime as well. That is dying from that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and again, shout outs to uh, Mitjitsu for um, finding all of the major skips we use in this run. And also for uh, making the tasks for this uh, run as well. And also being the only person to do an any percent run. Uh, please go watch that. It's pretty impressive that someone's able to pull that off in real time. Yeah. And thank you so much for having me at our present break. I'm so happy I finally got to show this off at the event. It's been a long time coming. <laughs> and uh, as always, as well as Working Designs like to say in the credits, uh, thank you to Mountain Dew and his friend Code Red. <laughs> and, <laughs> and to all patient Saturn fans who waited for this game to be released. Working Designs always has to plug something, don't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah.
All right, everyone. Welcome back to RPG Limit Break from Salt Lake City. I am Margaret Ann, but I'm actually going to throw it over to an interview. We have Patrick and Dan who are going to talk a little bit about why we're here. So pay attention and stay tuned. Thank you. Hi everyone, we're here at RPG Limit Break 2019, and we t wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about why we're all here, why we raise money. So we support the, we support NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and we work with them both on the national and the local Utah chapter level. So I'm joined here by Dan, who's going to speak a little bit about, you know, his experience working with NAMI and generally uh, kind of kind of a few things that NAMI tackles. So if you wouldn't mind kind of giving us a, kind of a, a brief story as to um, some of the things you work with NAMI with. Okay. Yeah, I could do that. I, I have worked with NAMI for about a year and a half. I've known about NAMI long before that, but um, I am the com uh, community outreach manager, so I get to go out into the community and I get to uh, talk to people about NAMI. I get to uh, talk to people mostly about mental mental health, mental illness, and the goal is, is certainly to educate people, to help people have better information, have accurate information, and and ultimately um, erase some of the stigma because because there are there are terrible stigma there t there's a lot of misinformation about mental illness and about the people that have mental illness I grew up with um, you know I was diagnosed at a, at a really young age with anxiety depression and and later on uh, found out of PTSD as well I didn't know a lot about that but um, from a really young age, I had issues with with parents and abuse, and uh, my son died when when he was nine months old. I had I had him when I was 16, and he died when I, when I was 17, and it sent me into a spiral of depression and substance abuse. I started using heroin and drinking a lot, and I, I was a heroin addict for about 20 years, and got clean, and and then found therapy and found treatment and found help and opportunities and was able to go back to school and become a social worker and now I work for NAMI so I get to I get to uh, try to give back what I got you know what was what was provided to me and the help and the and the uh, the unconditional regard and, and compassion that was shown to me so I I can't imagine doing anything else I can't imagine anything that would make me more happy than, than being able to do what I do with, with NAMI and be able to speak with people in the community and, and uh, try to, try to, try to uh, make people more aware of, of what mental illness really is and what it, what, and, and what it isn't, you know, so that there, there are better conversations. There's, more, there's less awkwardness. More people are able to reach out and get help. More people are able to communicate and have conversations without fear of being stigmatized or ostracized or, or pushed, pushed away. Great. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. And uh, yeah, I think we, we take our relationship with NAMI very seriously, and we're very happy to be here and raise money for them. So um, yeah, I think that's about it. But very much thank you for sharing your story. Thanks, we Patrick. appreciate it. And we'll uh, kick it back over to the main stage. Thanks. Thank you for that, everyone. We have plenty of interviews, or sorry, we have plenty of incentives for this one. We have the Earthbound Name the Kids for Character Limit, and we've had tons of donations coming for that, as well as for the deep, excuse me, Name the Player incentive that has been coming up. So I'm going to read a few of those donations that came in, as well as um, one that, um, came in right at the end um, of the MKR uh, run. Courtney Rail donated $25 saying, thank you for reminding me to donate. I discovered a mouse problem I'm trying to rectify that. But watching this run and listening to the great commentary is helping to take my mind off the rodent issues. Never knew about this game, but did watch the anime. Like the first season, the only season. Keep up the awesome work. We have a $300 donation 
from Orlux that says Bookas, because Bookas is one of the name the player incentives. We have a $50 donation from James DeBoll that says Garlapesh. I apologize for my horrible French pronunciation. At, at Le French Restream. We have a $100 donation from P. Diggity Dog that says Magic! A $50 donation from Dashnir that says Definitely. We have a $100 donation from Oralux that says, Daniel, Andy, I just want to tell you both good luck. We're all counting on you. We have a $250 donation from Nori saying, thank you RPG LB for all that you do. I appreciate NAMI for their work and they are a worthy cause for something that hits close to home for me. This has been a great week of background entertainment during work for me and it's only halfway over. Great runs, great runners, commentators and volunteers, great cause. Keep up the great work. Shoutouts to the great people in the Shining Force and the front lines. This goes to naming the player in Earthbound, Chibimut. We have a $25 donation from Silvermoon9000. Wasn't Brosentia the hero of Super Hydalide? This goes to naming the hero of Super Hydalide, Brosentia. have a $300 donation from Le French Restream. Hi from Le French Restream community. Really enjoying the chill show. We bring you our almighty rally cry, Garde la Peche, which you could translate as keep it up, mixed with stay rad. Thank you for this awesome and friendly event. Cheers. Happy faces. And we have another $300 donation from Oralux. We are going to have to cut off the Earthbound Name the Kids incentive right at the beginning of the run. Currently, Jeff is in the lead with $265. Um, NIV exclamation point. So Niv at 160. I-T-O-I at 154, Itois, perhaps. Angie at 30, A-N-G-I. Gyro at 25, G-Y-R-O. And the old standby, R-B, A-R-B-Y at 25. If you want to snipe one of those names or create one of your own to be the character names for this run, now would be the time to do it because we will be cutting that off momentarily. 